Good evening and welcome to today's campaign for the culture event. When the smoke clears, the intersection of nicotine addiction and mental health. Our campaign for the culture initiative is focused on uniting, empowering, educating, and engaging people of color and other targeted communities around critical health care and human rights issues connected to tobacco use, with the goal of inspiring young community members to avoid or quit tobacco use altogether. Today's event is a timely and important discussion. The tobacco industry is infamous for targeting its products to vulnerable populations, and people with mental health conditions are no exception. This has contributed to much higher smoking rates and much lower quit rates in this community. Mental health conditions are on the rise, particularly amongst our youth, and the tobacco industry continues to find new ways to infiltrate and target these populations. We've brought together an exciting panel of mental health experts and tobacco control advocates to explore these issues and explore really what can be done. But first, please enjoy a video from Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids and partnership with DoSomething.org to set the scene for today's discussion. No, don't crash. Okay, this is not happening to me right now. I'm really excited for tomorrow. Hey, I'm really sorry. I know you've put a lot of rehearsal time into this already, but we're going to use someone else for this project. Oh, okay. Uh, thanks for letting me know. Well, I've actually got a shoot coming up to promote a new vape product. Would you be interested in getting involved? No, uh, not interested in promoting anything like that. I'm burning through my cash now Cause I'm burning through my cash right downtown Guess it's about to go on old, old Feeling like my childhood's been stolen Mama's telling me to get a job But I don't know if that'll be enough oh, 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 oh. I understand it the pressure to use tobacco, the pressure to vape, it's all around us these days. And we need to stand up and take down tobacco. So join the movement and text TAKE DOWN to 38383. That was such an inspirational video causing, you know, calling all of us to take action. I would like to first bring to the stage our panel, uh, Tamana Patel, uh, to the virtual stage. She's the director and national council for mental well-being. She serves as a program director on a variety of national health equity initiatives focused on the intersection of public health and behavioral health, including the National Behavioral Health Network for Tobacco and Cancer Control. Welcome, Tamana. And Gianna Darvell. Gianna is the trainer, marketer, activist for the Truth Initiative. She's an Oakwood University graduate from Memphis, Tennessee, who is proud to serve as a truth activist, trainer, and marketer, leveraging her voice and perspective to gauge key decision makers, train emerging activists, and drive informed conversations about social and public health topics on the ground and in the media. Thank you for joining us, Gianna. And next to the stage, Dr. Nadia Richardson. Dr. Richardson is the founder and executive director of No More Martyrs. Dr. Richardson is a diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant, speaker, mental health advocate, and educator. She has over 20 years of experience as a diversity trainer, mental health, and nonprofit founder, leader, and university instructor. In the field of DEI, she has developed a signature program that equips clients to move beyond diversity and towards an action-oriented understanding of cultural experience 
responsiveness, identity, and implicit bias. Such important things. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Richardson. And finally, to the stage, our last panelist is Alex Shields. Alex is the U.S. Communications Social Media Associate for Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. Ms. Shields is a Townsend University graduate who recently received her Master's of Arts in Public Communication from American University. Welcome, Alex. Thanks for joining us. This is such a great panel full of activists and change makers, if I must say. Uh, you know, for first, I'm gonna, you know, let's really set the scene here if we can. And Tamana, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, if you could set the stage for us a little bit and tell us about the state of mental health today. It seems that, you know, really more people are experiencing mental health issues um, pre and post COVID. And discussions about mental health seem to have made their way into the mainstream. Can you give us a little bit more background on that? Yeah, such an important um, topic to discuss because an alarming number of young people prior to the pandemic struggled with feelings of hopelessness, helplessness, depression, and thoughts of suicide. Um, in the decade prior to the pandemic, mental health challenges were the leading cause of disability and poor life outcomes in young people. Um, what that looked like was um, suicidal behaviors among high school students increased during that time. Um, and about 40% of high school students reported persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness. That was before the pandemic. What we're finding now, um, after the start of the pandemic, we're two plus years in and it's still going. That youth and young people mental health, it's actually worsened. And a lot of the driving factors for that was due to so social isolation and continuous change. And so a lot of risk factors contributed to uh, this worsening of youth's mental health, including disruptions to routine, um, the experiencing of adverse childhood experiences and other trauma, um, uh, food shortages, financial insecurity, and all of these things really correlate to greater substance use. And so uh, when we think about it also contributing to these changes, right, what happened when schools, when, when youth were forced to go from in-person school to virtual, there's that loss of social connectedness that youth and young people really need. And so um, those heavily inf uh, affected um, by these changes that COVID brought on were those who were vulnerable to begin with, such as youth. Youth with disabilities, um, if we look across racial and ethnic minorities, LGBTQ plus youth, low income youth, youth in rural areas, in immigrant households, youth involved with child welfare and juvenile justice systems, as well as homeless youth. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's pretty dire. I think that you nailed it. You know, COVID only exacerbated problems on mental health that were seen prior to the pandemic and food insecurity and isolation and financial insecurity all, you know, contributed to the mental health crisis that we're experiencing today. And Alex, I'm just going to turn over you because Tamana said some really interesting things about the youth population. And, you know, in college, you were so active, co-founding a mental health organization for minority students. You know, can you give us a little bit of your perspective on what it's like being a young person in today's mental health climate? I mean, a little bit unpacking kind of the realities of what Tamana was saying. Sure. Um, it's extremely challenging um, being a young person in today's mental health climate. Um, youth are under an immense amount of pressure in every aspect of their lives. And that's especially what we were seeing um, on my college's campus and why my peers decided to start um, a mental health organization um, focused for minority students. Um, students were just really overwhelmed by every aspect of their lives, um, home life, academics, careers, jobs, you know, juggling all these things, your social life. Um, so, I mean, you name it, and students were going through it um, and tacking on that this was pre-pandemic, like Tamana said, um, you know, now there's even more challenges of feeling, you know, completely overwhelmed and consumed with uncertainty and wondering about the unknown and 
you know, I know uh, even now there's adjusting to this new normal that we're all living through. So it's all been kind of difficult. And, you know, that can be a lot for anyone and especially for youth. That's very difficult. So, you know, I personally believe and I'm sure others would agree that advocating for mental health is now more important than ever before. So, so true, Alex. And I think our young people are struggling the most. And thank you for your bravery to start an organization to address such issues, because most people kind of stand by and say, who's going to tackle that? And really kudos to you to, to taking leadership on that. And to that point, you know, Dr. Richardson, we know you have a lot of experience in this space. Um, we know that not only do people with mental health conditions face barriers to seeking mental health services, uh, but Black women are also less likely to utilize these resources. Can you speak on some of the disparities and really how can we address them as a community? Absolutely. Um, so we do know the statistics in regards to Black women and their utilization of mental health services that Black women are 50% less likely to utilize mental health services than their white counterparts. And there's a couple of barriers specifically that I'll speak to, um, two specifically related to stigma and the accessibility of culturally responsive mental health care, right? So when we're talking about stigma, we're talking about the various ways that Black women have been socialized to normalize distress. And we do that by internalizing these concepts related to unrealistic, unhealthy ideas around strength. This is when you hear the concept of the strong Black woman and you have to be strong above all, else, all other things, but it's not realistic. It's not human. It doesn't give any opportunity for us to showcase our vulnerability and our needs for support, which every single individual has. There's also distrust of the healthcare industry that gives rise to this stigma. And oftentimes when I'm talking about this distrust, I make sure to highlight that it's a justifiable distrust. When you think about the ways that Black women and Black populations and historically marginalized um, and disenfranchised communities have been treated inequitably by the healthcare system, how they've been used for research, how they have had resources denied them, um, and so we have to acknowledge that and not just tell Black communities and specifically Black women that they have to move past this distrust. We need to acknowledge it, acknowledge it and then equip them to um, and empower them to find resources that are going to be a best fit for them. And that requires education and awareness, which is why the education component, health promotions component is so important in regards to helping and equipping Black women to push past the stigma. The other aspect is accessibility to culturally responsive care. So we know that in regards to Black clinicians, it's very, very, very low. 2% of psychiatrists are Black, 4% of psychologists, only 11% of licensed professional counselors are Black, and around 22% of clinical social workers are Black. So if you're, some, if you're a Black woman who wants to actually see a Black clinician, you're going to have a very, very difficult time doing that. Now, with that being said, can Black women receive culturally responsive care from clinicians who are not Black? Absolutely. However, and this is the way the structural inequity is built into the mental health field, ongoing training um, for providing culturally responsive care is often not a part of the required curriculum for becoming a licensed clinician, right? So you can go through a full uh, four-year program and a master's program, and you might have some ongoing electives that are required for maybe an ethics training, but you're not going to be really held accountable for being able to push past your own bias and provide the culturally responsive care necessary, and that would increase Black women's utilization of services. You raised so many important topics and I can't wait to unpack them a little bit. Um, but since we're on the topic of stigma, which is such an important topic, I want to turn it over to Gianna. Gianna, do you see the stigma around talking about mental health changing anytime soon? And how can we continue to promote better understanding and encourage more people to be candid about their experience with mental health issues? Well, thank you so much for the question. And thank you, Dr. Richardson, for all of that information. As someone who is seeking a counselor right now, I think that's one of the ways that you continue to, to shift the stigma about mental health is to talk about it, to be honest about what you're dealing with. That is really helpful information and trying to figure out where to go next as I figure out, okay, if I'm not vaping, what am I doing to, to even try to start addressing these issues and offering tools in that way? And so 
thank you for that. I wanted to start there. But as far as the stigma about mental health, um, similar to what you were talking about, Dr. Richardson, with the, the strong black woman persona, me and all of my friends are embracing the soft life, if you will. <laughs> all of us are, are coming to this conclusion with so many other people and what's become more of a social media trend. Um, looking at what we've often been expected to uphold as Black women, as a member of a marginalized community, maybe as a first-gen college student, maybe as someone who was able to um, go outside of what was expected to the bounds of their potential, you are dealing with imposter syndrome. You're dealing with um, outside forces. You're dealing with whether it's the... Um, youth epidemic for nicotine addiction, or you're looking at just the colliding crisis of increased mental stress that's happening with people looking for ways to be able to feel better. And I mean, we, we've seen euphoria, we've seen all of these other things that have brought anxiety, depression, drug addiction, nicotine addiction, all of these really tough topics to the main stage in one of the most popular TV shows among people my age for a very long time. And so we're able to see really dramatic examples on a very, very large scale, but we're also able to see our peers via social media experience the same things we're experiencing. I was a graduate in 2020 and it felt like my entire world was crashing down. There was this lack of closure. There was uncertainty about the future. There was living with my parents who are watching and who I love, but who I cannot rely on forever. <laughs> All of these things that felt like they were such a normal and, and, and straightforward path for what we were planning to do going into 2020, completely changed. And so I think one of the biggest things that we can do both as leaders in our community, leaders on our jobs or leaders in our field is to be completely honest with people as we're experiencing issues of mental health, as we're experiencing challenges in addressing it ourselves, A, so we can continue to share helpful information just like with what we're doing right now, um, but also be able to instill a sense of community. I think especially when we look at marginalized groups, I uh, had an awesome opportunity to talk about this during Team Bo's Action Summit last year, it's all about community. It's all about having people that are walking alongside you as you are dealing with the difficult things that you're dealing with. And so one of my favorite topics in college was this whole concept of social penetration. Like, how do you make relationships with people? How are you able to you know, build connections? And it's this mutual disclosure of personal information. It's sharing more about me, sharing more about you, coming to know each other, coming to be able to support each other. And I think a really important component of this is also making sure that the information and the tools and the resources that we're sharing are nonpartisan and they're based completely in verifiable fact. It's so easy for things to get slated under, you know, the woke BS or the conservative this, like, you know, whatever people are choosing to look at it through that lens. But when you're able to show, hey, I have some information from this side, I have some information from that side, and I have information from someone who doesn't even necessarily ascribe to either one of these popular you know, identities, who are all able to verify the same things and able to share information that's helpful um, and accurate. And so it's a mixture of that community, it's a mixture of that transparency, um, and also making sure that we're able to meet people where they are, regardless of what their personal confirmed or unconfirmed biases are. You brought up so many excellent points, including community and shared relationships is so important, which I you know, I really want to emphasize the importance of this conversation of getting the information out there. So maybe just to pivot a bit, you know, to talk about the tobacco industry's targeting of people's experience with mental illness, right? So let's maybe kind of hone down on that. And Tamina, if I can ask you, you know, we know young adults with mental health conditions use menthol tobacco products at disproportionately higher rates. And adults who smoke and have mental health conditions are more likely to use menthol cigarettes than those who do not have mental health conditions. Uh, we know that the tobacco, in tobacco industry targets this population the most. Can you talk a little bit more about why it's important for us to eliminate menthol tobacco products specifically to protect people with mental health conditions? Yeah, absolutely. To start, you know, about 50% of all men mental health challenges, they begin by the age of 14. 75% of mental health challenges will onset by the mid 20s, right? So currently what we're looking at is one in five youth and young adults live with a mental health challenge. And so I think to answer this question, particularly around menthol, I want to back us up a little bit and under and, and ground us in understanding why individuals begin smoking, because we know the role that the tobacco industry is playing in this. Right. The, the predatorial marketing by the tobacco industry um, 
what does that look like? Actively working against smoke-free policies in mental health substance use treatment facilities, funding organizations and prominent spokespeople to leverage real concern about law enforcement abuses into opposition of prohibiting menthol cigarettes, right? They are really pulling out all the stops um, uh, to um, increase use of their product. And, and these tobacco products that use flavors such as menthol, which I think is the only flavor product left on the market right now, are attractive products for youth that youth will initiate tobacco use with or experiment with. Menthol itself is this chemical compound that cools, numbs the throat, really reducing the harshness of cigarette smoke. So it makes menthol cigarettes more appealing to youth who are initiating tobacco use. So about half of all kids who have ever tried smoking started with menthol cigarettes. Um, and about 41% of all current high school smokers use menthols. Um, in adults, but we see where the collision of mental health challenges and, and tobacco use, menthol use, uh, what, what we see is that 45% of smokers with severe psychological distress use menthol cigarettes, right? And so going back to why individuals began smoking, a large role, yes, is the predatorial practices of the tobacco industry. But what we also know is that there is a connection between adverse childhood experiences and tobacco use. What do I mean by adverse childhood experiences? That is a category um, that can, or categories um, that fall under abuse, neglect, and household challenges. It includes trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, intergenerational trauma, right? So trauma in general has a correlation to smoking initiation. And why this is so important to understand, particularly with youth, it's because their brains are still developing. It's that transitional brain age until 25 years old. And so early exposure to nicotine affects the brain functions that are really important for that reward processing, which makes it easier for young people to become addicted to nicotine. What happens when they are initiating their tobacco use and experimenting with menthol? They are more likely to become um, addicted quicker, continue tobacco use through adulthood, um, and uh, what we look at in terms of heaviness, right? The amount of use. Um, and then what's the impact on their brain development, right? Um, so what we know is that, um, you know, some use tobacco products when they feel stressed or anxious or depressed because they think it helps them feel better. Um, but using tobacco doesn't make these feelings go away. And so in addition to the impacting of the brain development, for some people, symptoms of mental health challenges may become worse when they start smoking. Um, and so it's really important that we have to understand menthol's role um, in that smoking initiation and the, the compounding effects with the onset, too, of mental health challenges. Um, and so it is a large public health issue, and there's going to be a huge public health benefit if we can effectively take menthols off the market um, and, and really reduce that use of, of menthol products. That was an excellent explanation. And, you know, Dr. Richardson, I may want you to kind of piggyback on what Tamana just said, you know, in your opinion, based on your experience, you know, how do mental health and nicotine use affect one another? So what is like the cause and effect of it? And a little bit to what Tamana had already alluded to is the effect on the adolescent brain. Can you get some more insight or examples on the impact that nicotine really has on adolescent brains? Sure, absolutely. So the research is already out that talks about mental health and substance abuse um, and the comorbidity and the prevalence of those things and the experiences. But what we really need to pay attention to when we're talking about these things is that the reason so many individuals, we're talking about adults, we're talking about adolescents, utilize this is because it's so much more accessible than actually utilizing your mental health services, right? You might have a month long wait to get a counseling session, right? You may not have you know, another 20, a 60 day wait 
to get into a treatment facility, you may have no hospital beds or no access or no clinicians that are accessible to you. But guess what? You can go get some cigarettes, right? You can go get some nicotine. And the truth is that nicotine does have that temporary release of dopamine, right? So it gives that positive feeling. But just like other substances, it's temporary, right? And it leaves individuals going out and seeking for that high that they just had or that they once had. And that's how the cycle of... Um, addiction happens, right? You're trying to recapture this feeling. But there's not a lot of information and awareness about how um, nicotine affects the brain, right? So how it really does pull the brain into creating a craving that pulls you closer into the addiction. It doesn't, uh, there's not much awareness about how nicotine actually reduces our brain's ability to produce its own dopamine, right? So now we don't have the ability to create that thing that we need for ourselves. And we aren't aware of the other natural, natural, more holistic ways of increasing dopamine in our bodies. Um, and then it actually reduces the effectiveness of other drugs. So for example, if you are taking an antidepressant, if you are taking something for anxiety, uh, the use of nicotine is going to decrease the effectiveness of this. And when it comes to the adolescent brain, they are particularly sensitive to these effects of nicotine, right? It affects learning, concentration, memory, and it actually gives rise to the development of psychiatric disorders and other cognitive impairments. We need to be very mindful of all of these things. That's so true. It's actually doing the exact opposite of what some of the medications are intended to use. And there is that sense from the dopamine that you're actually feeling better based on the menthol. So that's such an interesting point. And, you know, Gianna, I want to turn to you. We know that the tobacco industry has a long history of targeting people with mental health conditions, as we've discussed already. Can you share some examples of what that targeting really looks like in the past and what targeting tactics we are seeing today? Um, and then we'll, we'll chat a little bit more, turn to you maybe with a follow-up question after that. Sure thing, definitely. Well, I mean, going back to the 80s and 90s, for example, um, tobacco companies had a history of targeting psychiatric facilities with product promotions, with giveaways, um, and cigarette donations, things of that nature that kind of play into some of the facts that were just shared as far as it seeming as though it was something that could help make people feel better, when in reality, it could actually do the converse. Um, and so there's actually an example that is it's striking, which is striking enough that I think it's it's enough to get people's attention that back in 95, there was a North Carolina facility that was treating people for substance abuse, that was treating people for mental illness, that actually has a letter that was written to a tobacco company that was saying, hey, our clients were so happy during the holidays last year when you sent us several cases of cigarettes and the tobacco company followed up by sending 800 cigarettes as samples to this mental health facility because that's what they perceived as being a, a helpful thing. And so that's something that you know you can point to from more than 20 years ago and say, wow, that's wrong, it's bad, um, and it shouldn't be done anymore. But even now, Vaping, nicotine in particular, is being marketed as something that can help with those feelings of anxiety and depression and stress and overwhelmness that Alex was referring to and that so many others on this panel were referring to as well. When in reality, vaping nicotine can actually enhance those feelings of anxiety and depression. Um, and in fact, in a Truth Initiative survey that was recently conducted, 93% um, of the vapors that were surveyed said that vaping nicotine negatively affected their lives by making them feel more stressed more depressed and more anxious. And so there's lots of targeting tactics that look specifically at black and brown communities, that look at indigenous communities, that look at you know environmentalism, so many causes that I cared about, which is part of why I got involved with this in particular. Um, but I think as someone who has historically struggled with my mental health and recognizing that although there's information that supports the possibility and the probability of nicotine potentially enhancing those feelings, it's continued to be marketed and um, even misleading studies have been funded by Big Tobacco in order to be able to, to perpetuate this myth. And so I think the more work that we can do to bust the myth and to share accurate information, share the potential harms that exist, um, is really, really, really important in combating this crisis. I love it. And those numbers are staggering. Um, and, and as we wrap up this session, you know, I'd love to give Alex the floor here, you know, I really want to talk about the role that, you know, us as advocates 
concerned citizens, neighbors, friends, and family and organizations have to create change. You know, Alex, you joined the campaign for tobacco free kids recently as a communication social media associate. So how is tobacco free kids increasing awareness about the intersection of mental health and tobacco use? And how are you looking to get more young people involved in this process? Yeah. Um, so in my role, um, I have the honor of working on our Take Down Tobacco social channels, um, which are a lot more youth centered and focused. Um, and we've got a lot of great things in the works to increase awareness around issues such as this one that we're discussing right now. Um, we're actively trying to involve youth um, advocates in our social media efforts and outreach by having them be more present on our platforms. I mean, we're hoping that youth can speak to a number of issues raised related to tobacco use and speak out against the tobacco industry um, because we know youth are an extremely um, vulnerable community and the tobacco industry knows this. Um, and so since these issues affect youth, um, who better to really get involved with some of our work and speak directly to their peers about these issues? An excellent point, Alex, and they are lucky to have you advocating for these issues. Um, I know we're going to wrap up in just a minute. Any final thoughts um, before we wrap up? We only have about a minute left, but this has been such an engaging conversation, super interesting. You set the stage for this conversation. We really appreciate uh, your background information on this. Any last thoughts before we wrap up? Yeah, I just wanted to share really quickly. Um, I know I was able to provide a little bit of context when it comes to stigma and, and sharing information, but I wanted to make sure to um, share the tools that Truth has currently available, um, which include um, if you want to get involved with any of the work that we're doing, they touch everything from mental health to social justice to environmentalism. You can just text ACTION to 88709 and you'll get all of the information on what we're doing, um, information on the impact scholarships we have right now I'm um, going on so if you're doing public health work in your community you can actually be entered for scholarship funds at your school um, and then if you're struggling to quit vaping or you know someone who is you'll text that same number 88709 but instead of texting action which you text in order to get involved you'll just text ditch vape that's one word ditch vape to get involved in this is quitting which has already helped more than 440,000 young people on their journey to quitting vaping so those are both free tools that are available that's how i got involved with truth as far as just jumping in on a campaign that i found that was interesting and at this point i think i've been going four years strong with the group and i, I feel more empowered being looped in with an organization that supports me and empowers me to take my voice and take it back to my community so wanted to make sure i plugged those things and you. you can reach out to anyone at the truth Gianna, you're a rock star. This whole panel, we're full of rock stars. I, it's my pleasure to have this conversation with you. Um, I've learned so much. I know our, everyone listening has learned so much and uh, hopefully will take action amongst themselves. And uh, I think Gianna gave us great information about how to get involved. So thank you so much. Uh, let's take a look at a quick video from our partners actually at the Truth Initiative and their powerful video on the initiative Breath of Stress Air. Breathe in and wonder, is this helping? Breathe, breathe, breathe out. Now you should feel much worse. Vaping nicotine can actually increase feelings of stress and anxiety. Let's call a vape what it is. It's a breath of stress air. See for yourself. Breathofstressair.com That's such a catchy slogan. I love it. Breath of stress air. Thank you to our first panel. I'd like to welcome to our stage, our virtual stage, that is, of course, our next panel. Um, I would like to welcome Agurum Kaur, who is a U.S. communications and social media associate for Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids. Uh, she is the 2022 Barry Fist National Youth Advocate of the Year campaign for Tobacco Free Kids. And she started her tobacco control advocacy in middle school and made it her mission to educate her peers about the dangers of vaping and to stop the tobacco industry from targeting her generation. Welcome, Aguru. And then Catherine Bonyoy, she is the Deputy Director of Secession, a Smoking Secession Leadership Center at the University of California, San Francisco. The SCLC aims to increase smoking sensation rates and increase the number of health professionals who helps smokers quit. Welcome to the stage, Catherine. And next I'd like to introduce Miss Elizabeth Cook. 
She is the Senior Director of Social Emotional Health Alliance for a Healthier Generation. Elizabeth Cook leads content and strategy for Alliance for a Healthier Generation's Social Emotional Health Portfolio. Elizabeth intentionally strives to gain as many perspectives as possible through work and service. We love that. Thank you, Elizabeth, for joining us. And finally, I'd like to welcome, welcome Jennifer Kinder. Jennifer is the Director of Philanthropy at CVS Health. She is a strategic philanthropy professional with a history of connecting company purpose to broad scale community impact. In her role as Lead Director of Philanthropy, she creates impactful charitable giving strategies and initiatives, engages the country's leading nonprofit organizations to really drive change, and connects stakeholders to collaborate on addressing the most pressing community health needs. Welcome to the virtual stage, Jennifer. Thank you all for joining us. Um, you, we, we had a great engaging conversation to really set the stage for some of the issues that we'll really unpack here today. Um, you know, if I can turn to you, Agarum, you know, from your perspective as a rising college freshman, you know, what are some of the factors that you think that are weighing in on young people's mental health? I know we heard a little bit about the uncertainties of today and tomorrow, um, financial insecurity, food insecurity. I would love to hear your perspectives. And then, you know, to that point, what aspects of youth mental health should we be more focused on? What are we missing here as a community of practice? Yeah, I definitely think the last panel did a really amazing job of covering so many of the different issues that youth are facing right now. And just being in this transitionary period myself with just having graduated from high school, not having yet started my college journey, I found that there was sort of this gap in an identity almost where in school, I sort of had this identity as a student, as an athlete, as a friend. Um, and having these connections with my teachers and my peers, was it was all like there. I felt like I belonged um, in many of the different spaces. And now just having that sort of detachment of not knowing where I'm going next, of where my adult journey will take me, um, I think has caused a lot of stress and wondering of like, where do I belong? Um, and I know a lot of other youth have faced that as well. And I think that really leaves us even more vulnerable to the tobacco industry targeting, where they're able to send these false messages of if you use our products, you'll find the community here or it'll make you feel like you fit in. And I think that's definitely something that we as a community need to work um, to target against as well. And I think that really can come from so many different areas. But I think one that I personally feel is really important is right in the classroom, where I think students should be allowed to feel like their holistic selves, where we're not just students, we're not just athletes, um, and we're not just there to learn the content that's being taught, but we're holistic individuals. We're coming in with backgrounds, with different cultures, we have different home situations, and I feel like we really need curriculum um, and spaces that acknowledge that. Um, so I definitely think that's somewhere where I would really want to start with working and changing um, our situations on. It's such an incredible point. And you're so right. Holistic education is crucial. It's not just about getting the lesson of the day. It's really about these life skills that we'll have for the really the rest of your lives. You'll learn right in the classroom and hopefully with a really amazing professor or teacher. And to that point, as we talk about education, Elizabeth, if I can turn it over to you, you know, as a lifelong educator and school psychologist, can you speak to the importance of community really in helping individuals who are experiencing mental health issues? And how can we best connect with others for mutual aid and support? You know, and what can we do, if anything, we can do to reduce some of the discrimination and stigma uh, that maybe our peers or friends or family are experiencing who have mental health issues? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think if you think about um, uh, the last panel and kind of what was just said, I think there's this overarching thing co theme coming up around the importance of community and shared relationships. And, and what we know, right, is that humans neurologically are, we're social beings, right? We need connection. We need to, to be in space with folks who really recognize us, see us for who we are, honor, um, you know, sort of where we want to be and support our growth in that way. Um, and I think when you're talking about individuals who are experiencing mental health issues, that's even more important from both a prevention perspective and also from the perspective 
um, of recovery. And so I think when we think about sort of, you know, the uptick in mental health from the pandemic, to me, you can almost draw this straight through line between this like actual disconnection, right? The physical disconnection that we had and then folks starting to experience um, an increase in, in uh, feeling mentally mentally unwell. Um, and we know that your community-based supports, whether that is the community of your school, whether it's your faith community, whether it's your neighborhood, whether it's a community that you, know, you self-identify with because, I don't know, you like to play co-ed volleyball, right? Whatever that is, is incredibly important in making you feel seen and like a whole person, like was said um, before. And so I think the more that we can connect with each other around those pieces is really, really good. I want to um, address the stigma piece to me because it's really interesting when you think about stigma and discrimination. And um, I like to use my own story for this. So I'm a person with um, managed anxiety. Uh, I'm a psychologist by training, right? So like I live and breathe sort of men mental health. Um, and uh, I grew up in a family with which this was totally normal and okay to talk about. My mom um, is a mental health social worker. My grandmother did religious education for individuals with disabilities. So like I grew up in like a dismantle ableism advocacy kind of setup. And I would not talk about my anxiety. Like I just wouldn't, right? And so I, for a minute there, I had to sit and like really self-reflect and un unpack like, Elizabeth, my friend, like you do this for a living, right? Like you try to support people and kind of coming over this, what's going on with that? And that's when I really, really fully appreciated how nuanced and insidious and deeply ingrained we have in our culture and our society around what it means to be mentally well and healthy and sort of what it means to sort of not be that, right? And you don't want to be that, right? There's something wrong with me? Why can't I overcome this? And those types of things. So, you know, to me, when we talk about any kind of bias or discrimination, the first place is to just sort of self-reflect on your own stuff, right? And like, where are my barriers? Where are the things that I'm coming from? What is making it uh, sort of within me? What is the lens that I'm bringing this that, you know, is making me feel this, this type of way? And then I think we talked about this earlier, but then we like we talk about it, right? You know, we talk about it and we um, take it seriously, but we also joke about it. We bring some levity to it. We normalize it and recognize the fact that when we talk about mental health, right, mental illness, right, all of us at a certain point in time will experience and feel, right, feelings of sadness or anxiety or concern or uncertainty or overwhelm. So what does it mean to normalize that and the coping mechanisms around that and then be able to identify folks that are feeling it to maybe uh, more of an extreme level, right, where they need some additional supports. Um, the last thing I want to say around discrimination in particular is this is a place to really look at our systems as well. Um, so in addition to being a school psychologist and my work for a healthier generation, I'm also um, on my local school board. And one of the things that we did during COVID was we approved sort of extra leave uh, for for staff, right? Because educators in particular, I th think are feeling even more acute stress uh, than um, a, a lot of our, our professionals. And it was like, well, should we like officially tag this as mental health days off? And I was like, no, right? Like there's a place to talk about it in a community setting, right? Where we wanna talk and we wanna support. And then there's places where we can just tell you like, hey, we're going to give you time off. And whether you're taking it because you've got a cough or a fever or whether you're taking it because you're feeling overwhelmed with life is sort of like not my business. And I don't need to call you out in that kind of way. Right. So we need to think about sort of the time and place with which we you know, celebrate and honor and discuss and the time and place we say, hey, here are the supports and services. Take them, enjoy them right? Limited questions asked so that you can get the support that you need. And we're not going to go into parity between mental health care and, and physical health care, but there's a lot of stuff to, to be done on that end too. So, um, you know, just a couple of things we can do to help support uh, stigma reduction and discrimination. In oh my gosh. World. I love that. I think we all can relate. And why hasn't anyone changed it from just a regular day off from a mental health day to- It's like the simplest thing. It's like a simplest <laughs> solution, right? Like it's it doesn't have to be that deep. 
Yeah, that will be a number one way to reduce stigma, right? So the whole office doesn't know you're taking a mental health day. And, you know, as Elizabeth kind of mentioned, you know, that the systems are really important. And Jennifer, if I can turn it over to you, you know, you're kind of in the corporate system, if you will, you know, leading up a large organization like CVS Health, you know, and the whole purpose and mission of CVS Health is centered around fostering, you know, healthy, healthier communities. Mm -hmm. And you guys became the first national national big U.S. drugstore to remove tobacco products from its stores in 2014. Yes, cheers all around to that. And then you led the CBS Health Be the First initiative. Can you tell us more about the Be the First uh, initiative and why CBL, CBS Health remains so committed to really reducing tobacco use, especially among young people? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity to join this really incredible panel and discussion. And um, you're right, looking at systems change from a corporate lens um, may seem difficult, but I am proud that CBS Health is very committed to addressing the systemic uh, you know, reasons behind why there's so many health inequities in this country. And I think our investment and commitment to removing tobacco from our stores was a very pivotal moment for our company um, and helped to solidify our purpose and helped to make sure that we were putting our customers and our community first. Um, that was a five year, $50 million initiative that um, we finished about two years ago. But as you mentioned, we are still focusing and investing in tobacco prevention um, for a number of reasons. One is the evident piece around how tobacco still is one of the leading causes of death um, you know, in the country. Um, the other is as we were in the middle of our commitment, you know, vaping came along and all of a sudden there was this whole new uh, you know, epidemic around uh, youth vaping. So we know that there's um, a strong correlation between uh, substance use among youth and their mental health uh, concerns that certainly have been spiking um, uh, post COVID. So as we look at um, addressing health inequities for us, addressing tobacco just makes natural sense, but really tying it into and understanding the mental health component to it, why youth are, are using cigarettes to, to cope or are vaping to cope. Um, why are there uh, mental health inequities and a lack of culturally relevant resources, you know, as Dr. Richardson says, and for us, um, you know, really looking at how we hear from youth, how we understand what it is they're um, experiencing and using that community voice and that youth led voice is very important to us and something that will continue to weave into the ways that uh, we stay committed to tobacco prevention. Amazing initiative. Thank you so much for your commitment and investing the resources to re this really important issue. You know, I want to dive a little bit deeper into the science, really, that intertwines mental health and tobacco use. So we'll kind of nerd out a little bit. You know, Catherine, if I turn to you, can you explain some of the misconceptions about tobacco and nicotine use and perhaps share some facts about tobacco and mental health and how they really impact each other just to give us, you know, the, paint the picture a little bit. or so it'll, it'll make it stick in our head a little bit, some figures we can take home. Uh, yes, I would, I would love to do that. So many things to say, so little time. Um, a lot has already been said, first panel and some of the speakers that have gone before me. So, but I, I'm going to bring up the ones that I think are really should be resonating with the group. So, um, I mean, first thing, just to encapsulate, if you think about it, we have about 25% of the population in the U.S. that has a behavioral health condition. And of that population, they're smoking about 40% of the cigarettes sold in the U.S. So that kind of gives you some perspective as we go forward and listening to the different things that we've heard today. But one of the things I wanted to bring up is that nicotine isn't necessarily what is killing folks over there. It's all of the toxic chemicals that are emitted when tobacco is burned. So tobacco smoke contains like this deadly mix of like 7,000 different chemicals. There's about 100 that are, that are toxic, about 70 that have been proven, right, to cause cancer. I'm sure there's others. There's formaldehyde, benzene, toxic metals, arsenic, poisonous gases, carbon monoxide, you name it, right? So just making sure that we understand nicotine is what hooks folks and it's the tobacco that kills. And I say that because I think it's really important to understand that nicotine replacement therapy, right, is very safe and effective to help people quit. 
Um, so there's that. And then second, I think like we, we've heard a little bit about this, but there are uh, there is a common misconception that smoking and nicotine kind of relaxes people. So there you are. You've had uh, long been using cigarettes and people have long been using cigarettes. And now tobacco products that we've heard about e-cigarettes and such as a way to cope with stress. And when actually it's complete opposite. So every time you finish a cigarette, your body starts to go through withdrawal and it doesn't feel good. So it feels better when you smoke another one and another, and that's just the way addiction works. And unfortunately, it's not um, really doing any good for anyone, whether you have a mental illness or you know, you're coming from various communities. So we all have to keep that in mind where it's an addiction and it is not helping and people are responding to that withdrawal. So um, these feelings, when it comes to folks with mental illness, they get that feeling it temporarily masks these symptoms. And so they're more inclined to want to keep smoking, keep smoking, keep smoking, to keep these symptoms, to make them feel less anxious, or even in some cases to mask uh, schizophrenia or symptoms of schizophrenia. But unfortunately, these, these individuals are dying upwards of 25 years early, loss of life, 25 years. And most of that is attributed to tobacco-related illness. And we heard, I think just earlier from CVS that we're looking at still the largest preventable cause of death, right, is, is cigarettes. And the yearly amount of folks that die from tobacco use is about half a million. And of that population with the behavioral health community, they represent half of those that are dying every year, so like 250,000. Uh, another misconception, and I'll go as quickly as possible here, but um, a lot of clinicians that are out there, we, we folks were touching upon this in the earlier session, um, feel like, oh, you know, we don't want to help them quit right now while they're in treatment um, for their mental illness or their addiction. It's best let them be, let them have their cigarettes, even family members. Like, let's just let them have their cigarettes while they're in treatment. Please don't take them away from them. We'll deal with it later. But, you know, 25 years earlier, death, loss of life, you, you really do have to see this as a priority. And it's much more likely that somebody is going to die from tobacco than the drug that they're in treatment for. So that's a strike one. And in fact, quitting smoking has an equal or greater effect on mental health as an antidepressant. I think I may have heard that earlier, but it is so important to note. And for those that are struggling with um, addiction recovery, quitting smoking actually will improve their chances of long-term recovery uh, and abstinence for by 25%, 25%. And lastly, this piece I heard again, but I want to reiterate, their tobacco smoke does interact with all sorts of different medications, including psychotropics. It makes them less effective. It's dealing with the metabolism, the absorption, all of that. And so this means that um, if someone is a smoker and say they have their anti-anxiety medication, they need more medication to make it uh, effective. But more meds also means more side effects. So if someone quits smoking or doesn't smoke, they're going to have less meds that are needed and less side effects. And this is very important in this community of uh, behavioral health where a lot of folks have to have a lot of medications for a lot of different reasons. So those are my, my main points here. Oh, Catherine, I just got chills a little bit. I mean, I think all of us can can relate. And I think when you said the numbers and you said the statistics, mm -hmm. gave some background, we really, really stuck to me. Um, mm -hmm. Particularly as we think about young people. And I've heard those sayings in my own family, just let them have the cigarette. It's okay <laughs> if it gets them through this day, you know, just let them have the cigarette. And we're doing more harm than in fact good. And Agumrup, I'm going to turn over to you as we look at young people a little bit, you know, do you have any recommendations for adults and organizations looking to help young people quit tobacco? How can we better engage, you know, your peers, um, all these organizations that are on the phone, all these mental health experts that we have here, how can, how can they better reach young people? What are your suggestions? Yeah, I think it really comes back to community where young people feel like they can be trusted um, and young people can trust the people they are talking to, whether that's adults or fellow peers or whoever it may be. I, the, the spaces really need to be ones that they feel that they can resonate in. Um, and I think that can really come from so many different uh, places where I know from personal experience when I was in health classes giving sort of a tobacco um, 
lesson on tobacco products and the tobacco industry, we talked about not only the harms that tobacco products brought on to individuals, specifically youth, um, on the organs as they're still de developing with so many of the toxic chemicals um, that are in these products, but we also went into the story of the industry, how they had years of targeting on communities of color, how their products were specifically marketed to youth uh, with flavors, with mar um, other marketing on social media, and and such. And so with that, we really found that youth resonated with being able to see their lives um, in front of them, where they were able to see all these components in their own life and really recognize that. So I think it was really a focus on almost skill development, really coming back to this holistic sense of feeling like they had the opportunity to learn more about how they could continue in their day-to-day -day lives and really build healthier selves um, for themselves and for quitting specifically, I wish we actually had more of this where we had support groups that youth can go to where they can see other youth that are in the process of quitting and really feel like they can share their experiences with each other. I feel like that would have so much more of success rate um, and having successful quit journeys. Amazing suggestion. I think support groups for youth specifically would be amazing and thinking about innovative ways to do that. Maybe that's through social media. Maybe that's through other mechanisms that really capture youth attention. It's a fabulous idea. Um, Elizabeth, if I can turn to you, how can we as individuals, you know, really better equip ourselves to both seek the help we need right? And to support others. So it's that dichotomy that we always are trying to weigh there, right? Yeah. So tells them them quit tobacco, give them health or both or all of the above, <laughs> right? right? <laughs> so. um, well, I, you know, it's, it's interesting for me to think about, right? So I always like to take the perspective of like, what does it mean to be sort of human-centered or person-centered? And from a supportive perspective, um, and this is uh, hard for me, I'll just name, um, that means you got to sit down, right? Take a seat and really listen and really co-construct with a, with a person. I think a lot of times, particularly us that are sort of in on the upside of power, right? Like I have a, you know, a group of students or I have a, a child or I'm a professional or whatever that is. We come at this with like, here's what we know and you ought to know that too, right? And, and like, if I just serve up the information to you that that's somehow going to like manifest itself in the change that I want to see for you without stopping to think like, what is the change that you're looking for, for you, right? So I think to me, the first place in being a supportive individual is really sitting down and listening and supporting folks and saying like, what do you want? What's working for you? What's in service for you and what's not? And how can I help you, right? What help and what support do you need? And really offer that as an invitation as opposed to sort of a, of a telling. Um, I'm a little oppositional by nature, but I think most of us like, don't really like to get told what to do. So uh, whether you're a youth or whether you're an adult, uh, it's generally not a good strategy. And I would say on an individual perspective, um, I like to look at this as a twofold interaction between what I need to do as an individual, but what the system is allowing me to do. So I could have, you know, the, you know, interest, right, uh, to, to be, you know, to be help seeking, to seek support. And then like we talked about earlier, like the resources aren't there or the resources that really resonate with me and, and my identities um, aren't there. And so I think for us, as we're talking about individuals, we always want to cloak that in like, okay, what do I need, right, to do things that are in service of my own wellness so that I can feel the way that I want to, right, so I can thrive the way that I want to, right, in combination with how is the system around me either conducive or harmful in my sort of achieving those goals. And it's that really that interaction that I think we always need to be um, getting back to uh, and thinking through more deeply. That's right. They say you can't help anyone else until you help yourself. You know, Jennifer, I'm going to leave you with the final words. Where should we be investing in speaking out to reduce the barriers and help more people with mental illness quit tobacco? Any suggestions? You know, it, it was mentioned so many times, and that's the word community and community voice. As Elizabeth just said, listening to and understanding the youth um, who may be battling with tobacco addiction or mental health issues, what is it that they need? but it's also understanding the system of how we got here. Why is the BIPOC community being more adversely affected by tobacco use and targeted by these tobacco companies? And what can we as partners all do about that? Um, I think that the, the um, idea of collaboration is key. Um, Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids and Alliance for Healthier Generation are teaming up right now as we speak to provide more culturally relevant materials around tobacco prevention for BIPOC students. 
Um, that needs to happen. And that needs to happen with us collectively, listening to the community voice and understanding you know, how we can not just, as Elizabeth said, dole out materials, how we can make sure um, that we're hearing youth at where they're at and what they need from us at this point in time. Famous last words. I love it. Community, community, community. That is the key. And I think we've all taken away so much from this panel. Thank you so much, panel number two. Thank you to panel number one. I always feel like the hour speeds by. There's so much information, but I'm so happy we were able to have this conversation. I've personally learned so much and I know our guest and audience has as well. So this concludes our conversation today. Thank you so much for joining this important conversation about the intersections of nicotine addiction and mental health, and really how to take action. Uh, just a few reflections. There were so many nuggets from this conversation, but we really learned about the corporate support to these initiatives, reducing stigma, critical life-saving intersections between mental health and nicotine that we could apply for our families and friends. And we really unpack some of the barriers, including stigma and culturally responsive mental care health approaches. And the final big word of tonight is community, right? Community and voice, listening, understanding people and systems. We urge folks to get more information from the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids at, there'll be a link here at CTFK, link tree. E -E -C -T -F -K. You can learn more about how to get involved and we urge policymakers in particular to take action to protect kids from tobacco in your area and share your story about why you're passionate about taking down big tobacco. Thank you all for attending tonight's conversation. Have a good evening.